Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning and thank you for our day together. We pray our hearts and our minds would be open to receive from you, to learn from you, to love like you better. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are in the lectionary today, so I want to welcome you if you're new. Uh, what I do, there's this thing uh, in the more liturgical churches, your Catholic churches, Episcopal, Church, Episcopal churches, and Lutheran, and Methodist, something like that, that and even, even some DOC churches, Disciples of Christ churches, not Department of Corrections, but Disciples of <laughs> Christ churches will uh, use the lectionary. The lectionary is a book that is, uh, or, or a book, it is a uh, listing of readings and what are called lessons, but scripture, uh, scriptures that are put together from the Hebrew scripture and from the, what we call the New Testament, and they're combined uh, to give you basically a three-year period of time. If you go through and follow uh, the lectionary readings and lessons, you will have, the theory is you're going to read most of the highlights of the whole Bible in about three years' time, Right? So um, I follow the lectionary. Today, uh, there is, I typically will read out of the gospel uh, reading and lesson of the day. Uh, I tend to think that out of our holy scriptures, uh, that the Jesus story is the most compelling uh, and the most important. And so that's why I usually end up focusing on the gospel lesson in the lectionary. Not that I don't believe holy scripture is important and all of it is important, but I think that especially in America, uh, we have a real fascination with Paul. And uh, it's interesting that we don't have as much fascination with Jesus. And, uh, and also, Paul uh, is someone who's really easy to, to, to kind of mix into what, kind of make it be what you want it to be. And uh, I, I think a lot of that comes from misreading of Paul. But it's just easier to do that. Jesus is harder to misread. Jesus is kind of in your face and like, look, you, the way you love sucks, stop it. And let's do it like this. Like you're saying you're, you're loving, but you're not. Let's, and so Jesus is very much is always going to confront us with whatever line we draw on the sand. Jesus tends to be on the other side of the, the, the sand of that line with the people that we've just excluded. Amen. So I tend to like the Jesus story. I tend to like to read the Jesus story in the gospels and see what Jesus did and said and how it challenges us and how we find ourselves being corrected <clears throat> by the Jesus way, and then trying to become more like Jesus and doing the Jesus thing in, in our own lives. Are you with me? So today, uh, I'm, we're, we're uh, reading in the lecturing Mark chapter 6. We're in the gospel of Mark right now, basically is where we are, if you haven't noticed that already over the last few weeks. Uh, today, I'm calling this, The Empire Always Strikes Back. Um, some of us will get that reference, and... Uh, and if you don't, I really don't know what to do about that. I feel, I feel really sorry for you. But um, I'm also stealing from uh, my New Testament uh, professor, theologian, that uh, I'm being taught uh, by at Phillips Theological Seminary, Warren Carter. And he has a whole, uh, uh, in several of his books, but in one of his books on the Gospel of Matthew, he has a whole, title, a whole chapter titled, The Empire Strikes Back. And uh, so this is kind of one of those Empire Strikes Back stories. You'll see what I mean here in a minute as we read. So read along with me, not out loud, but you can just follow. Uh, King Herod heard of Jesus and his disciples. Really quickly, King Herod was uh, the king of the Jews. He was chosen by the Roman Empire, was in bed with the Roman Empire. Even though he was the Jewish king, he was... He was really a pawn of the empire, if you will, all right? So King Herod heard of Jesus and his disciples, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, the, he, he has these powers, they're at work in him. But others says, no, it's Elijah. And others said, it's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard this in this talk, he said, John, whom I beheaded? <laughs> has been raised. All right, so now we're going to go into a little, we're having a flashback, right? So Herod begins to remember what happened. Herod himself had sent men that arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, 
because Herod had married his brother's wife. And that's what you do in the, by the way, that's what you do in the, uh, in the empire. You just take what you want because you're in power, right? And who's going to say you can't do it, right? Because you're just going to get killed. So, so, the, 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 so anyways, this is what's going on. And Herodias had a grudge against John, okay? Because John was teaching, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife, right? And uh, which is kind of like, it's so weird. It's like so Captain Obvious. It's like, but it's not, but you see, listen, listen. That's the point about empire is that the things that seem so obvious become so distorted by power and wealth and prestige and privilege and their place that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what the law is. Laws are just for those people out there that just need to stay in line. Those of us in power, we can do whatever we want because we're, I mean, like, we're going to stay, it doesn't matter to us. Like, we're, I can take my brother's wife if I want to. Are, are you with me? All right. So John is preaching out, one of the things that he's saying in, in his preaching out in the wilderness is he's preaching against the empire. He's preaching against Herod. He's basically, he's not just He's not just preaching against Herod. He's preaching against the empire. He's saying the empire is perverted and you need to come out of it and be baptized and repent from this perverse generation. Remember, that's what John was always saying, right? Come out of the city, which means come out of the status quo and the empire and the way that it is operating and then repent, change your mind, go a different way. That's what John was saying. He wasn't just saying, Oh, it's bad to have adultery. That's not what he was saying. He was pointing out that even king of the Jews, Herod, had fallen into the imperial ways. He had turned to the dark side. Are you with me? Are you with me? And this is what John was talking about. And, and, and Herodias was like, you need to shut him up. All right, so here we go. Let's move on. I had a whole bunch of thoughts run through and I decided, nope. <laughs> and Herodias had a grudge against him, wanted to kill him, but she could not for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and he protected him. Uh, Herod was afraid of John, okay? Please understand that because ultimately when push came to shove, Herod beheaded him. Uh, it, it's, it makes this sound like that Herod was like, he was a really a good guy, but he kind of, no, no, this is a guy who, who was, <laughs> was seriously in bed with the empire, and he, he, but John had such a massive following that Herod was afraid, so he didn't want to put him to death, all right? So that's what's going on there. So he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet. Everybody say banquet. Herod gave a banquet for his uh, courtiers and his officers and for the leaders of Galilee. So this is an imperial banquet. When the, his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you wish and I will give it. And he saw, sounds like a guy who's been drinking a whole lot. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask, I will give you. Just ask. And then she said, I want the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests. <laughs> this is a weird thing. It was like, well, I got to please the guests. We got to have a beheading. <laughs> I mean, is that an imperial banquet or what? You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's not done until somebody gets beheaded. And so he did not refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard uh, with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head out on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body, and they laid it in a tomb. That's our lesson for the day. <laughs> Isn't that precious? So that's a fun little story. Um, I, I, I just, I want to say just a few things and, and, uh, and, and show kind of why I think, this is my 
opinion and, and my thoughts on why I think this story comes right here at the kind of middle beginning of the Gospel of Mark. Um, the point of the story, I think, is that the empire always strikes back. Uh, if we, I've made some notes here. I went back and I started looking at the earlier chapters of Mark. And starting in Mark chapter 4, um, Jesus, there's some stories about what Jesus is doing. And then after this imperial banquet where John the Baptist is beheaded, there are some more stories that happen in, even in chapter 6. We're not going to go further than that, but we'll get to them um, in, in, later in, in the lectionary. But I want to just touch on them like what happens after this story of John the Baptist being beheaded at this imperial banquet. All right. In Mark chapter 4, in Mark chapter 4, there's a whole litany of, of Jesus' parables, basically that are those parables that, are, that start with the, the kingdom of God is like. Have you, you guys remember those? The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. Uh, Richard Bowles preached on the one that talked about the seed that is a small thing and then it becomes a large tree, right? Where every, say it with me, every kind of bird can find shade and grace and hope and life, right? So, but that came out of Mark chapter four, that the kingdom of God is small. The kingdom of God is little. It's like seeds. Uh, they have to be buried and die in the ground. Like you don't get to see it immediately. It doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't look like anything at first, right? And, and, and some seeds do die. Some seeds, they, they, it's, it, they get trampled on and some seeds get in thorns and some seeds. And so the kingdom of God is small. That's the first kind of thing that happens in Mark 4. Jesus is setting out this idea of the kingdom of God, the empire of God, the empire of the heavens is like this. It's small, but it grows. If you give it attention, if you give it uh, 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 water, if you give it light, if you give it, you know, uh, uh, then it, it, it starts to grow. Then there's a story in Mark chapter four. It ends with the stilling of the storm where Jesus is going out. Remember, I talked about this. Is it, does the sea belong to Satan? Does the sea belong to Caesar? Or does the sea belong to God, Right? And that in those days, they, those are the two beliefs, that, that the sea belonged to Caesar or that the sea belonged to Satan, right? That, that's where the demons were. And then Jesus shows up and he, they're getting ready to die in the storm and Jesus says, be quiet. And they're like, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him, right? So, so there's this amazing, so Jesus said, all right, the kingdom is small, it's going to grow. Some of it, sometimes there's going to be death. Sometimes it's not going to take. Sometimes it doesn't get enough water. Sometimes it doesn't work, but it's going to keep on growing. But it's going to be small. It's going to be small at first, right? And then he goes out and he says, no, I'm going to show you that this kingdom doesn't belong to Caesar. This empire, this world doesn't belong to Satan. It belongs to God, right? So he does this amazing miracle. And then we get into Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, we see the first thing is that he heals the Gerasene demoniac. This is the, that famous story where, where they go across the water and there's this guy who's, got, who's basically naked and he's chained up in a cemetery. It's a really great Stephen King moment. And, uh, and he's yelling out and crying out and Jesus looks at him and says, you know, what's your name? And the guy goes, Legion, because there was many of us, right? <clears throat> and he casts out those demons and they get in the pigs and they run off. All right, so he heals the demoniac. Right. So again, this is this is Jesus saying that the the empire has demonized us. The empire has has created uh, health issues and mental issues, and and the, and the not shepherds, the ones that should be taking care of the people, are not. And there are people that are literally dying and being demonized and being being uh, beaten down by the empire. And Jesus comes to set those people free. Right. Then. Later on in Mark chapter 5, it ends with this, the story of the 12-year-old girl who is sick and Jesus heals her. And then the woman who had been sick with 12 years of an issue of blood touched the hem of his garment and then he, she is healed. So we start to see Jesus saying, the kingdom is small, it's going to work, it's hard to see sometimes, it starts out little, it doesn't look impressive, but God owns it all, God takes care of it, it's not Satan's world, it's not Caesar's world. He heals the little girl. He heals the older woman, right? You see that it, th these things, th this is Jesus exposing the empire, 
showing that these things, uh, that the empire makes us sick and makes us hurt and makes us hungry, right? But that God and God's empire, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, right? The idea that the kingdom of God is coming, but it's small, it's little, you don't always see it. Sometimes it dies, but I'm healing, I'm doing, I'm touching. I'm doing. But then we get into Mark 6, just like last week we read that there, but Jesus was rejected. He was offended by the people at his hometown, right? And they were offended, not that, about what he said, but that he said it, because he was breaking up the status quo, right? He was saying, no, not, we're not going to do it this way, Caesar's way, the empire's way. We're going to do it God's way. Amen? And then we have the death of the, uh, the story of the death of John the Baptist at the imperial banquet. Right after that, we have a feeding of the 5,000 story in Mark chapter 6. That's the next story that happens is the feeding of the 5,000. Right after that is Jesus walks on water. There's another water story, right? And then there's the last one is that he heals the sick in uh, Gennesaret. So chapter six, it, it's weird. We I, I, like four and five are building up. Like the kingdom is this, it's small, it's little. You have to look for it. Sometimes it dies. It doesn't always work, but it's there and it's building and it's growing. And then he heals and then he heals and then he sets free and then he, storm, he seals the storm, right? And then there's the feeding of the 5,000 and then he heals the, he walks on water. Then he heals the sick in the town. But right in the middle of those stories, is this the Empire Strikes Back story? It's the beheading of Herod, of, of, of John the Baptist by Herod. Now, why is that there? I think it's there <laughs> because I think that Mark, the writer of Mark, is brilliant. I think that the writer of Mark is saying, look, even though Jesus is calming the storm and even though Jesus is casting out a man with a legion of demons and even though Jesus is healing the sick, the empire is going to strike back. The empire is not just going to go to sleep and say, hey, you know, whatever, if you want to take us down, if you want to speak truth to power, if you want to topple the whole system, go ahead. No, they're not going to just lie down and die for you. Are you with me? Are you with me? It is a story that the empire, the powers that be, the, 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 the well-connected, the networked, those that are the elite, those people that have power, that pull the strings, that make the decisions, that set the status quo, that is deeply embedded in every city, in every town, in every nation, in every country. Amen? And it is extremely difficult to push back on those systems. And when you begin to push back on those systems, that empire always strikes back. And so I want to end, that's really literally all I really want to say. I mean, that's, uh, because here's why. Here's why that's all I want to say. Because really that's all we need to know right now. Like, in, and we'll continue to go through the gospel, Right? But what we need to know right now is that just because we believe that we found the Jesus way, and just because we believe that the best way is to live that out and to be open and affirming and loving and accepting and arms wide open and, and table wide open, right? Instead of building bigger walls, build a bigger table type of stuff, right? Instead of, uh, of, of casting people out, bringing people in, instead of saying, no, this is not the way you do it, say, yeah, it doesn't matter. God loves you just the way you are. Amen? And by the way, it's not that God loves you just the way you are, but loves you too much to leave you that way. That is the worst theology of all. Have you ever heard that? God loves you so much, he's not going to leave you the way you are. Shut up. <laughs> Sorry, that was, that was for free. But that one, I, I hate that one. I really hate that one. I hate that. That is spiritual abuse. That's spiritual abuse. Amen? I mean, just say amen there. Just I'm telling you. I'm telling you when you say amen. That's spiritual abuse too. Anyways, um, I hate that. I hate to say like love the sin or hate the sin. I hate that. That's spiritual abuse. Either we're accepting and we're like Jesus and we love the way Jesus loved or we don't. 
right? That's it. That's, I mean, that's it. All right, so, what I, so when you begin to live that way in a world and in a government and in a country and in an empire that does not live that way, and all the systems are built to live the way of the empire, and you begin to say, well, I don't want to live like the empire tells me to live. Oh, okay. All right, sweetie, you're going to get it now, right? It's coming now. Because you don't, you don't get to just talk um, smack is, I guess, the word that I can say here. You don't get to talk that way against Caesar, against the empire, against the status quo, against the, are, are you with me? And when we begin to stand up and be a people that say, like John the Baptist did, say, look, Herod's living a certain way. He's the king of the Jews. And that's absolutely unacceptable. That gets you beheaded. Amen? It gets you beheaded. But I thought that Jesus was, kingdom of God was coming and it was at hand and it was going to be a big tree that every kind of bird, and I thought he was going to steal the water. Yeah, he does. I thought he healed the sick and cast out demons and fed the 5,000. He did. He did. And the empire still struck back. And the empire, not everybody made it out unscathed. Amen? And the reason that I tell this little community here called Simplicity in Oklahoma City this is because I feel many times that we're like John the Baptist's. I feel like we're out in the middle of the wilderness crying out saying, this place sucks! Come out! Right? Come out of it! And has anyone ever gotten any pushback for doing that? I have a whole set of friends that I don't have anymore. Are you with me? Come on. I got. To, thank God I haven't been beheaded yet. But I'm telling you, the empire strikes back. The empire's not going to lie down and play dead for you. It didn't for Jesus. Ultimately, the state, the empire killed Jesus, right? Now, the ultimate, the ultimate, you know, every kind of bird that Jesus gave to the empire was that uh, Jesus raised from the dead. <laughs> sorry, sorry, just stay with me. So I, that, I think the ultimate, <laughs> oh, God help us. I don't know who's going to kill me first, the empire or the congregation. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't hear anything. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act like I didn't hear that. Okay, so that's what's happening here. That's what the story is. The story is that... S- the empire strikes back. The empire comes after those of us who are going to say, I'm not going to live this way. I'm not, going to, I'm, I'm not an American first. I'm not going to give in to your, your American religion, your American Christianity, your American nationalism, your Christian nationalism. I'm not going to go that way. I'm just not. And if you want to call me a liberal, if you want to call me a progressive, if you want to call me a socialist, I don't, that's fine. But I, I don't see myself as a liberal, socialist, progressive. I see myself as a Christian. I really do. And I know a lot of people say that. I, I get it. That's a lot of people. Well, I'm not this. I'm a Christian. Well, but I really, I believe that I'm trying to follow the Jesus way. And if that looks like it might be what other people call liberalism, fine. I don't care. I'm not doing it because of the Democratic Party. I'm not doing it because of a liberal politician. I'm doing it because I'm reading scripture and I see Jesus goes against the empire every time. And we live in a day that also has an empire. And so I'm just going to do what Jesus did. As much as I feel like I can and as much as I feel like I possibly understand, I'm just going to do that. And I've got to recognize that it's not like that's going to create a wealth of, 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 of excitement or fame or fortune for someone like me or someone like you. We're not going to be the people that necessarily are going to have, you know, multiple thousands of people show up and we're just going to, you know, it's the cool place to be. I, I, we're fighting against imperial forces that are structured and, and systematized. Amen? And sometimes the empire, no, not sometimes, but always the empire strikes back. And sometimes that means that people get killed, people get maimed, people get hurt, people get excluded. And, it, and we just have to, listen, we just have to keep on going. Amen? 
The last thing I'll say is this, is I, I think it's really interesting how the imperial banquet was the killing of John the Baptist for speaking out against the empire. And right after that, we have the feeding of the 5,000, which is a Jesus empire of the heavens banquet. So we have these two banquets that are juxtaposed to one another. We have the powerful elite, right? That are in bed with the empire, the status quo, and who are okay with a man's head being passed around on a platter at a party. That's sick. But that was the empire. And right after that, we see Jesus going out thousands and thousands show up. And what does he do? He has a banquet. He feeds them. Why? Well, I think it's another subversive move by Jesus saying your banquets look like this. But our banquets are actually going to take the people that you should be taking care of and they're hungry and they're hurting and they have nowhere to go. And we're going to feed them. That's what Jesus does. Amen? Isn't it beautiful? It's just a simple, he's got them there. They're all tired and hungry. And Jesus says, sit down. We're going to eat. Because this is what the empire of the heavens looks like. Every kind of bird showing up. Every kind of person. And being fed and being loved. And there's, there's a lot left over. Amen? So there's those two stories of banquets next to each other. <clears throat> so, what banquet are we going to? What banquet do we subscribe to? What banquet do we RSVP to? Where are we going to land? Where are we going to be? What are we going to say is important in the priority of our lives? And, and, and us as a, as a Christian uh, congregation of people, right? What are, what are we saying that we're going to do in this world? How are we going to act? What are, what are we going to say? What are we going to do? What are the actions we are taking? And as we do the Jesus way more and more, the empire will strike back. But what is our determination? Are we determining that if it gets too hot, if it gets too much, we're gonna, we'll, just, we'll back off? Or are we willing to say, I'm going to keep on going all the way, no matter what, because this is the Jesus way. Amen? So, so there you are. The empire always strikes back. Know it. It's going to happen. But what are we determining right now? Where are we going? What are we doing? But that's what we have to uh, determine now. Amen? So, I, you know, it's kind of a weird story, isn't it? It's a, kind of a depressing read. But when you see it in the context of what comes before it and what comes after it, you see, I think, what Mark is trying to do. It's not always easy. Amen? Mm -hmm.